Yeah, this could be exciting as an energy resource to South Africa. So what is, what is fracking? Hydraulic fracturing uh, was invented in the Extracting gas from tight so shale. People are going to get jobs doing this. In the Karoo, we've never had something like this. So we can't drink it without getting sick. The animals are dying. Sit me and we keep drinking water in the wrong forms. And we can't do it before deal. And we can't do it before deal. And we can't do it before deal. So there's lack of employment and lack of job opportunity and lack of foreign invest. It was one of those stifling midsummer afternoons in the southern tier of New York State. And despite it being well beyond 6 p.m., the community hall was sweltering as residents entered the room. They were there to hear about my research on fracking, a controversial form of gas extraction that was pioneered in their country, in the United States, and is now being proposed to mine and many others across the world. And while I stood there speaking, bruised and drained, after months on the road through North America, my mind drifted again as I tried to make sense of what had just happened and try to piece it all together. How did a young South African girl wind up 10,000 miles away from home, on the wrong side of the road, alone and armed with nothing but a camera? How did she go from being so optimistic of what fracking could mean for the Karoo to journeying from one community to the next in the U.S.? and covering case after case of contamination in a race against the gas, the gas industry's swooping gag orders, which buy each victim silence. How did she end up in catcalling tussles with male gas workers stuck out in rural Colorado or risk arrest while filming in Pennsylvania? I was just a curious kid with a camera on my shoulder. I didn't sign up for any of this. But then his words from the back of the room rushed forward and collided with me at a force that would forever alter my trajectory. An elderly Pennsylvanian gentleman stood up and disrupted my conversation and pointed at me and said, excuse me, ma'am, I don't mean no disrespect, but I look at you and I see another one of those leftist radicals. I look at you and I see one of those occupiers. And before we continue, I'd like to know whether you consider yourself an environmentalist. Hello. My name is Jolyn Minna. I'm a journalist, a filmmaker, and a photographer. And in 2011, a very different me stumbled across fracking quite accidentally in a note called newspaper. But because it had something to do with the Karoo, a vast, semi arid area at the heart of the country, an area where I grew up, and because I've always had this annoying, innate, inquisitive streak, I decided to do some after-hours research. And fracking, it turns out, forms part of a very controversial form of gas extraction, where large amounts of fresh water, chemicals, and sand are forced deep below the Earth's surface at high pressure to fracture the shell rock in order to release the trapped gas, and get that back up to the surface, where it's then used for heating and cooking, to generate electricity or in the use of pesticides and plastics. 
it had been linked to water contamination, and, you know, disruption to natural ecosystems and air pollution, but I was more worried about getting to the bottom of the debate. I was more frustrated about the lack of information, more annoyed that it had become a mudslinging debate between economists and greenies. And so I set about trying to establish some sort of middle ground, some sort of accurate base of open information. That curiosity streak has culminated in unearths, and with the help of ZT Studios and Stage Fire Films has become an international independent investigation that investigates fracking from a global perspective in order to understand what this practice, what this source of energy could mean for the Karoo and many other countries currently considering its implementation. My work has appeared in government papers, in university studies, and I regularly share my findings at, conferen at conferences both locally and abroad. But before I ventured down this rabbit hole, before I was the person I am here today speaking to you, I was, in retrospect, hopelessly naive about my place in the world. Yes, I wanted to help people. Yes, I wanted to mean something. But at a time that suited me, and at my own pace, and at my own terms, I was running from print deadlines to shoots. I had no idea what fracking was. I thought it a cheeky headline. I didn't really know what went into me switching on the light or me filling up my car. I never imagined that I'd be able to set water on fire. In fact, a good friend of mine describes it quite well. He said, it's like she was out having a great night watching one of her favorite bands, and on her way home, she stumbled across a Captain Planet edition, and she got the job. So what exactly happened between me discovering that headline and standing here today? Well, having grown up in the poor rural heartland of the country, and having gone to boarding school in what I believe was a very new South Africa in 1995, I've always been deeply committed to working toward a better South Africa or a better tomorrow for all who live in it. And when I heard about the plans to frack in the Karoo, I was incredibly optimistic that it could alleviate the poverty in the area. Because any environmental concerns at that stage were dismissed in a meeting that I had with Shell one of the major companies seeking to drill in the Karoo. The head of Shell reassured me that they've been fracking for 60 years, that it's a time-tested technology, that there are no issues. He told me that there are no documented cases where fracking has contaminated water, and that in the name of prosperity, we should allow multinational corporations into the country to access the gas that is rumored to lie below 38% of the country. Secretly, I agreed with him a position that didn't make me very popular at dinner table conversations in the Karoo. Environmentalists, I thought. <laughs> Those placard-wielding, tie-dye-wearing Luddites standing in the way of development. And then one day I received a phone call. A phone call from a man in Pennsylvania whose property had been destroyed by gas drilling activities, whose water had been contaminated by levels of methane that made his home unsafe to live in. I went to inspect and unfortunately, he was far from the only one. The Manning family, high levels of methane and heavy metals. The McAvoy family, exceedingly high levels of arsenic. The Moten family, exceedingly high levels of barium. The Teal family in West Virginia, who had radioactive drill cuttings buried on their farm without their knowing. Little Billy, four-year-old Billy in West Virginia, nosebleeds and asthma after being exposed to volatile organic compounds in the air. These are but a few of the cases, and many of them have been forever hidden from you, from your media, and from your government, because those families have been forced into gag orders with the offending gas company in order to ensure their silence and to buy a track record that claims that there are no documented cases where fracking has contaminated the environment. And so I stood there in the community hall, sharing these findings that were still so fresh to me, I spoke softly and slowly, hoping that as I repeated what I had seen, they would make more sense to me. Hoping that as I spoke, I would try and understand how a very happy-go-lucky South African girl who landed on American soil was now heading home five months later, an empty, deeply disappointed, haggard shadow of myself. How I gave up other plans that I thought I once had and ended up spending two years on an investigation that took me across three continents to get to the bottom of the ever-expanding, ever-excruciating, 
economy versus environment nexus. And there I stood in the whole community hall, falling silent and waiting for me to respond to this man's question. Excuse me, sir, I'm not too sure what you mean. I get accused of being an environmentalist far too often for someone who considers herself a journalist. So for today, I'd like us to establish some sort of definition for an environmentalist. An environmentalist is someone, you know, people that spend a lot of time protecting nature. I'm sorry, sir, I'm still not too sure what you mean. Nature, is that a space in which you and I exist? Or is that a separate entity that these placard-wielding hippies are fussing about? Nature, he said, the birds and the trees have answered the question, are you one or are you not? Because based on that, I'm not going to take your findings seriously. All right, sir. So according to your definition, an environmentalist is someone who spends a lot of time and energy protecting the natural world, the world in which you and I exist, in which you and I depend on clean water and clean air, the natural world that our economies depend on, are you kidding me? Shouldn't we all be one of those? And in that moment, I received my wake-up call. In that moment, I knew that I could no longer seek exemption behind the lens. I knew that I was there, that I had borne witness. Since then, I've swapped life on film sets to life on the road, working with communities to design better development strategies that suit their area, that capitalize on the abundance of natural resources in their community. Since then, I've switched to solo, I've become a vegetarian, and I now have rerouted my course to using my camera to tell stories that matter, to ask uncomfortable questions that I think most of us would prefer unanswered. On the one hand, rapidly depleting energy resources require new technology and policies to cater for an ever-expanding global population. And on the other hand, finite natural resources are being threatened by soaring consumption rates, exacerbating the air, water and soil pollution currently taking place. And while ecosystems fade away acre by acre, from one extinct animal to the next, the world hurtles toward a climate catastrophe that brings with it volatile shifts in weather patterns and threats to global socio-political relations and economic stability. And in between all of this, the provision to the basic necessities is becoming increasingly centralized and corporatized. And more often you see that what is meant to be a national development plan is being blurred with a corporate business strategy. It is no secret that the world is in trouble. We stifle innovative solutions and long-term sustainability. We invest in today by sacrificing tomorrow. The world as we know it urgently needs to hit the refresh button. And to do so, it needs you and I to realize that we hold the power that things aren't going to get any better unless we accept our place in the world. I don't think I'm here to motivate you yet today because I'm still wrestling with the change and understanding my new journey. But what I am here to tell you today is that all of us, no matter our age, our background, our interests, need to open ourselves up to what's happening in the world, to open ourselves up and take heed to whatever wake-up call might be coming our way whether it's in the painful gaze of another bushman being forced off his land for tourism, whether in the crack of another tree hitting the ground to make way for a parking area. You see, some never need a wake-up call. They grow up knowing it already. To others, it takes the wind to knock it out of their chest, and to others, it's an earnest whisper in the wind, and to others, they prefer the door to remain closed. But if that moment hits you, it'll startle you. And it's likely to hurt. Because up until that point, you probably never did do your recycling. You probably never really did consider using your bike. You probably never thought that your vote meant much in national elections or that writing to your local councillor would solve much. Up until that point, like me, you probably thought it easier to assume that someone else would shoulder the responsibility. And up until that point, those that were actively doing something were the others were the radicals, were the misfits. But today, I'm an everyday kid standing here and telling you that I'm proud to be one of them. It's about telling stories that matter. It's about writing songs with meaning. It's about spending Saturday mornings tutoring pupils at under-resourced schools. It's about switching off the lights and forgetting plastic water bottles. It's less about retweeting and online petitions and more about rolling up your sleeves 
and actually doing something about the problem in your community, in your society. It's about taking the road less traveled and engaging with what you find. It's about grassroots up and not boardroom down. It's about being part of a cause greater than oneself. And so when that wake-up call arrives, and I believe that it will, don't run away, please don't. I tried, it didn't work out well. Instead, take a deep breath and feel your heartbeat and start a new chapter. Embrace it and revel in it. I need you to. Your community needs you to. And the world needs you to. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.